from the Buddhist tradition. Who caught the monkey? Once upon a time, there was a small village situated near a forest. The forest was full of monkeys who constantly stole food from the village. The villagers soon grew tired of having the food they worked so hard for disappear into the mouths of monkeys. So they held a meeting. They decided to hire a hunter to capture the monkeys. The hunter tried very hard to nab the elusive creatures. However, the monkeys were very fast, climbing and jumping from one tree to another. The hunter failed to capture even one of them. Just as the hunter was about to give up, a wise old man approached him. In these stories, there's always a wise old man. <laughs> he told the hunter to get a rope, a coconut, and some peanuts. Following the old man's instructions, the hunter cut a hole in the top of the coconut just big enough for a monkey to fit its hand in. He then placed the peanuts inside the hole and tied the coconut to a tree with the rope. By this time, the hunter was really tired, so he went home to get a good night's sleep. The next morning, the hunter went to check on the coconut, and there was a monkey running around the tree in a circle with his hand stu uh, stuck inside the coconut. The other monkeys were screaming in the treetops as they watched the hunter carry off the hapless monkey. They learned a harsh lesson not to steal food from the villagers. The question remains, who actually caught the monkey? Well, once the monkey had his hand stuck in the coconut, he tightened his fingers around a handful of nuts. His fist became then too large to withdraw from the hole. The monkey would not let go of the nuts and remained stuck until the hunter grabbed him. The monkey caught himself, imprisoned, because he would not let go of something he wanted. A few years ago, during the uh, first sabbatical that I took as a minister, I was fortunate enough to spend several months traveling in Ecuador and Peru. One afternoon in the city of Lima, I took a walk through a beautiful park full of lush gardens and whimsical statues. This park sits at the top of a sheer cliff, and way down below there are a few beaches and then the immensity of the Pacific Ocean. As I walked along, I saw people up in the sky paragliding majestically sailing through the skies, hanging under brightly colored parachutes. They'd sail along the cliff, soar out over the ocean, and climb hundreds of feet into the air, higher than the tops of high-rise hotels and office buildings. I was mesmerized. And as I walked, I passed a sign there in front of me, a sign announcing that paragliding rides could be purchased. If you, want to, if you want to see what this looks like, on the front of the order of service, there is a, there's a view of, of what the experience kind of looks like there. It wasn't very expensive. In fact, it was alarmingly inexpensive. <laughs> yes, I will purchase a paragliding ride. And so the, the idea of flying, of flying is, is extremely romantic, but the preparation is inelegant. First, you're strapped into an uncomfortable harness. Then the paragliding pro, the guy who is going to steer the thing and keep you both alive, puts himself into a similar harness and straps himself to your back. Then, parachute trailing off behind you, you're instructed to run as fast as you can towards the cliff. Now, it's hard. It's hard to run with someone strapped to your back. <laughs> so don't worry, though. There is an assistant, a third person, behind whose job is to push you. <laughs> and so what's supposed to happen 
what's supposed to happen is that as you reach the cliff, an updraft of wind from the cliff will catch the parachute and send you sailing up into the skies. Let me observe that this decision to run towards the precipice does not feel natural. <laughs> it's counter-instinctual. You want me to run in the direction of the cliff as fast as I can? It's against my nature. The sermon this morning is about letting go and, and holding on. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're better off letting go of, some things we'd rather not let go of, and what in the end is really worth holding on to. It's easy to talk about letting go. It's much harder to actually let go. In fact, trying to let go can feel like running towards a cliff. It's easy to think of reasons not to. It's uncomfortable and scary. But the payoff, the payoff at the end is a feeling of liberation and exhilaration. But getting there is not that easy. When it comes to letting go in order to live happier and healthier lives, there are certain things we're better off letting go of. In most of our lives, in some way or another, we live having reached in to that coconut to take a stubborn grasp, a hold of something that keeps us stuck and trapped, and something that's easy to let go of, but yet we're not quite willing to do so. Maybe we hold on to anger or jealousy or blame, or we hold on to grudges, or we hold on to self-righteousness, or we hold on to the wish for something or someone to be different than they are. And our unwillingness to let go becomes something that gets us stuck and keeps us trapped. We're better off, we're healthier when we're truly able to let go. There's another story from the Buddhist tradition. It's, it's pretty amazing. A lot of the stories from the Buddhist tradition all deal with with sort of creative circumstances, um, and uh, the, the lesson at the end is a lesson about letting go. In this story, there are two Buddhist monks traveling on, along a road where they come to a small river. On the riverbank, there is a woman asking for assistance in order to reach the other shore. The first monk tells the woman, I'm, I'm sorry, but the vows that I've taken as a monk do not permit me to have physical contact with women. The second monk scoops her up on his shoulder, carries her across the river, and sets her down. The two monks continue on the road, but the first monk is upset at his traveling mate, criticizing and chastising him for having broken his vows. Finally, the other monk has had enough, turns to his companion and says, I set her down on the riverbank. Why do you insist on continuing to carry her? <laughs> Letting go. Recall Nelson Mandela's words about being released after spending 27 years as a political prisoner on Robben Island, Robin Island. Mandela writes, As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Letting go isn't just about parting ways with anger or resentment. Towards the end of the book, Life of Pi, there's a startling line. I suppose in the end, the whole of life becomes an act of letting go. What a powerful and troubling idea, this notion that the central narrative trajectory of our lives is one of having to let go. The line is about the inevitability of loss. The lesson is that life goes hand in hand with loss. Life involves the loss of loved ones, of family and friends. Life involves the loss of health and coping with the realization of our own mortality. Of course, loss is the great lesson, writes poet Mary Oliver. To live is to face those black rivers of loss whose other side is salvation. There's a famous sermon from the Unitarian tradition that focused on letting go and holding on in theological terms. In 1841, Theodore Parker preached a sermon entitled, I love the, the titles, A Discourse on the Transient and Permanent in Christianity. The sermon was about an hour and 45 minutes long. 
and didn't even contain an interesting story about paragliding. <laughs> the sermon simply asked, in matters religious, in matters religious, what is transient? What will we need to let go of? And in matters religious, what is permanent? What can we faithfully hold on to? Theodore Parker said that almost everything is transient, but a very, very few number of things are permanent. Parker's sermon began by him delighting his audience, talking about various changes that have occurred throughout the history of the Christian church. The doctrines change, creeds change, rituals change, sacraments change, traditions change, ideas about the Bible change, even theological understandings of God change. Or, in Parker's flourishing words, it must be confessed, though with sorrow, that transient things form a great part of what is commonly taught as Christianity. In our present state, perhaps some forms are necessary, but they are only the accident of Christianity, not its substance. They are the robe, not the angel, who may take another robe, quite as becoming and as useful. And the doctrines that have been connected with Christianity and taught in its name are quite as changeable as any form. The reaction to Parker was much less favorable when he began pointing out that the Unitarians don't get a pass from this transience business, that there's much that we are holding on to that we will have to let go of someday. It's not that transient things are bad. They only become trouble when we hold them too tightly and insist that they never change. So what is permanent? What's worth holding on to? Theodore Parker said in his famous sermon that the only thing that is unchanging is Jesus' central message about love of God and love of humankind. The only thing that doesn't change is the fact that we're supposed to love one another and love the ground of our being. That's the only thing to hold on to, he said. Everything else, everything else will change. We may need to let go of everything else. One of my famous, favorite spiritual writers, Anne Lamott, writes about discovering a community of faith at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church in the Bay Area. Uh, Anne comes to this church, Anne Lamott comes to this church knowing uh, struggle and suffering in her life. Earlier in her life, she had struggled with addiction to drugs and alcohol, and, and she was, when she found this church, raising her son, Sam, as a single mom, and writes that when she was at the end of her rope, the people at her church tied a knot and helped her to hold on. And that knot that they tied was not about theology, or a specific understanding of the Godhead or a set of requirements for salvation. The knot they tied was not about the forms or traditions. It wasn't about the way in which communion was served or which version of the Bible was used in worship. The knot that they tied simply had to do with love, with care, and with compassion. Anne Lamott writes of her experience in her church community, my son was welcomed and prayed for seven months before he was born. When I announced during worship that I was pregnant, people cheered. And then almost immediately, they set about providing for us. They brought clothes. They brought me casseroles to keep in the freezer. They brought me assurance that this baby was going to be a part of the family. And they began slipping me money. Now, a number of the older women lived pretty close to the bone financially, but routinely they sidled up to me and stuffed bills in my pocket, tens and twenties. It was always done so stealthily that you might have thought they were slipping me bindles of illicit drugs. <laughs> she goes on to describe a woman in her 80s who used to slip her a baggie full of dimes tied with a twisty. And she described at first a feeling of shame and embarrassment for receiving this generosity. But then she recalled a line from William Blake that we are here to learn to endure the beams of love. And she was moved to tears in gratitude for the beams of love she received. At first glance, nothing seems more impermanent, more transient than a beam of love, than a kind and compassionate gesture. Nothing seems more fleeting than an act of love. Other things might seem more permanent to us. Buildings and traditions and institutions, statues and awards. And I guess that what I'm trying to say this morning is that there, if there is any 
religious wisdom that teaches that all of those things will pass away sooner or later. We understand that everything will pass away, will come to an end, will turn to dust. I grew up as a Unitarian Universalist, and many of my formative experiences of my adolescence took place in my congregation's youth group. And at these area youth conferences, we had a tradition. At the end of the youth conference, we'd gather in a circle together and hold hands and sing. We'd not, not shalom, uh, but we'd sing a song together. The lyrics to the song went, May the circle remain unbroken. Uh, in some ways, it was an odd song to sing. After all, the circle was about to break. Our parents were out there waiting in their cars to pick us up. I'd see some of them again, but this exact community would never reconstitute itself. But there, in that midst of letting go, a song we'd sing about holding on, holding on to warmth and welcome and acceptance, holding on to the sustaining power of community, holding on to those beams of love. For me, that was one of the earliest experiences I had of beloved community, a community that would sustain me, a community that provided a knot for me to hold on to. At St. Andrews, for Anne Lamott, the knot came in the form of casseroles and cash and in the form of a full embrace of her and her son. Home, Anne Lamott writes, is the place where they have to let you in when you show up. In UU community, we tie knots. We embrace the human spirit. We become a home beyond belief. We become a community that holds us, a place of radical welcome and acceptance. So what is it that you will need to let go of? What things will pass for you? What ultimately will be transient in your life? And in the end, what is worth your holding on to? What beams of love will you carry forward with you? So I'm standing on the precipice of the cliff, the guy strapped to my back, and we run towards the cliff, and we run towards the cliff, and we go off the cliff. And something happens. The, the gust of wind that's supposed to raise us up is not as strong as it ought to be. And so we begin to plummet. Not fast. I'm still here. You know, you know the end of the story. I'm still here. But we begin, and, and the, the, the man is yelling in Spanish, and, and I know what he is saying is that he, we're going for the, for the playa, for the beach, and not for the mar. We we're going to try to land on the beach and not for the ocean. And we plummet, and we plummet, and he's behind me yelling and freaking out, and I'm beginning to freak out, and we are, we're heading down, and we swoop in, and we tumble on the beach, and just, we're, we're a, just, a t just tumbled full of parachute and bodies, uh, and he stands up and, and asks me, are you okay? And I say, yeah, and he, he's okay. And over um, on the beach, his cousin has seen us going down and, and comes with the car. And we stuff the parachute back in the car. And he says, let's go again. <laughs> and so we climb. We, 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 we drive all the way up the cliff to the back. And, and I say, it is time to let go. So we, so we, we put, I, 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 we, we, we reattach ourselves and we string it out and we run for the cliff a second time. And this time the wind catches us and we sail up hundreds of feet in the air above the high-rise hotels, above the cliff, above the ocean. I suppose in the end the whole of life becomes an act of letting go. And in the midst of that letting go, may we remember to hold on to love and to compassion and to the knowledge that letting go is not easy. Amen.